So thank you so much for being here. Um, I am the SVP and Executive Director for the American Heart Association here in Minnesota, and am really happy to be welcoming three amazing speakers today to share with you a little bit about blood pressure and healthy habits, including healthy eating, physical activity, as well as quality sleep. So let me tell you a little bit about each of our speakers today before we get started. So first, Dr. Peter Ekman is a cardiologist at the Minneapolis Heart Institute at Abbott Northwestern Hospital in Minneapolis. He has published dozens of scientific papers and is a section editor for the American Society of Artificial Internal Organs Journal. And we are so lucky to have him serving as our board president right here in the Twin Cities. So, so excited to have him here. And then Julie Sieber is a member of the AHA's American Heart Association's Minnesota Advocacy and Community Impact Committee, longtime volunteer, and she's on the board of Urban Roots, an organization on the east side of St. Paul, which works with youth development through programs of wellness and nutrition, gardening and conservation. Although she ret has retired from 28 years in public health work on chronic disease prevention, she continues this work as a volunteer and enjoys trying new foods from other cultures even and cooking for family and friends. So happy that she's with us. And then finally, Dr. John Park will close things out for us today. And he is a, an associate professor of medicine in the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Mayo Clinic. He is nationally and internationally known as an expert speaker whose research has focused on obstructive sleep apnea, delirium, and quality and safety improvement. So I'm sure you can tell from all of these descriptions of our incredible speakers how fortunate we are to have their, their knowledge with us this morning. So without further ado, I will pass this on for Dr. Peter Ekman to get us started. Well, thank you for the invitation to speak today about uh, hypertension, also known as high blood pressure. Um, before I go to my next slide, I, I uh, realized I forgot to add a slide uh, noting that I don't have any uh, disclosures that are pertinent to this topic today. Uh, next slide. So high blood pressure, how is it defined? Um, you, Anyone who's ever been to the doctor or had any medical care for almost anything has had their blood pressure checked at one point or another. And usually it's described in terms of two numbers, the systolic number and the diastolic. The systolic is the top number or the peak um, that really corresponds to the pulse when your heart squeezes. And the diastolic number is what is the pressure when your heart is relaxed. And so the, the two numbers uh, give a full picture of the status of your blood pressure. Um, typically, if you have a systolic pressure greater than 130 and a diastolic pressure greater than 100 or 80, excuse me, um, or if you're on antihypertensives, if you meet any of these criteria, by definition, you have high blood pressure. This is an incredibly common problem. Over 120 million Americans have this, uh, about half of men and uh, for, uh, 40% of women, just over 40% of women. And the incidence increases dramatically with age from uh, folks in the 20 to 34 age group. Um, it's anywhere from 15 to 30% of people have it. And I think you uh, can appreciate that by the time people are over the age of 75, 85% of people have high blood pressure. It's thought that some of this has to do with the essentially hardening of the arteries as we get older and our vascular tone, as, as it's often described, um, becomes less elastic and that's a major contributor. Um, but I think you can appreciate that even by the time people are, are in middle age, almost half of people have high blood pressure. So this is an incredibly common problem. 40% uh, of adults are unaware they have it. It is particularly prevalent in black Americans. And uh, your lifetime risk of developing hypertension is between 70 to 86%. So this is the problem that if it doesn't affect you now, it probably will eventually. And if it never does, it almost certainly will affect those that you care about and other uh, members of your family and uh, friends. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the American Heart Association defines blood pressure in terms of different categories. Normal would be systolic less than 120 and a diastolic less than 80. Uh, elevated is uh, in the 120s. Uh, and, but if you hit a systolic pressure of 130 or a diastolic pressure greater than 80, you are defined as having high blood pressure. 
this is called stage one. If it's over 140 or over 90, this is stage two. And if it's over 180 or over 120, this court could portend a hypertensive crisis. And there are a number of things that can happen if you have particularly high blood pressure. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why we care so much about high blood pressure in the next couple of slides. Uh, but I think this just highlights that uh, the level of high blood pressure does portend some risk in terms of how uh, much damage it may cause. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, is that it's easier than ever to do home monitoring of your blood pressure. Uh, this was from just a quick Google search the other day uh, and you know the first half dozen um, options that popped up. Um, as you can see, there's a number of different configurations. Many are for your arm, some are for your wrist. Um, the, there are also a variety of price points, uh, just in the example here, uh, from $24 all the way up to $379. Um, and so this is something that there are options for uh, almost every budget and every lifestyle. Um, and so this is something that I would encourage you to consider investing in particularly as in this era, we're doing a lot more telehealth and remote monitoring. Um, this is a great way for you to get some of the same care that you get in the doctor's office uh, by monitoring this at home. Uh, next slide, please. So why do we care about high blood pressure? Um, it triples your risk of stroke. Uh, it can precede vision loss or lead to vision loss. We have such tiny capillaries in our eyes and high blood pressure causes damage in these arteries and that can lead to a decline or even loss of vision. Um, heart uh, is a huge factor here and the heart is what pumps against this blood pressure. And so if you have high blood pressure, it can lead to heart failure. It doubles your risk of heart failure. That's my particular specialty. It also is highly associated with heart attacks and hypertension or high blood pressure is a major risk factor in development of atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries as it's often described. And uh, this can lead to heart attacks, can lead to strokes. Um, so this is why it's such a huge factor and why we care about it so much. High blood pressure also accelerates deterioration of kidney function. And so people with uh, any degree of kidney disease are at especially high risk of progression and they need to be particularly aggressive about making sure that their blood pressure is well controlled. High blood pressure has also been associated with sexual dysfunction, which is something that's not often talked about, but is an important quality of life factor. Um, it's been estimated that uh, for every 10 millimeters of mercury that your blood pressure goes up, um, your risk of death increases by about 15%. And it's been estimated that if we were able to eliminate high blood pressure, we would reduce uh, about a third of the cases of death from cardiovascular mortality, which includes largely heart attack and stroke. Next slide, please. This is an example, or I should say a couple of examples of what does it do to your heart? Uh, the heart is a muscle, as I said, it pumps against your blood pressure. The model on the left, it's kind of a, a slice through the section of the heart looking down the barrel as if you were a red blood cell about to leave the heart. Um, kind of looks like a donut or maybe more like a bagel. Um, the little hole in the middle, that's where the blood is and that would be pumping out through your aortic valve into your body. Of the uh, thinner area on the left side is actually the right ventricle. And then on, on the right, the normal heart, I think you can appreciate the thickness of that muscle is much less. And so long standing high blood pressure will lead to thickening of the muscle, which you might think, well, great, I've got a strong heart, it can pump really well. And it does squeeze well, it does eject the blood well, but it's not very elastic. And ejecting blood is only half of what the heart does. The other half is that it actually receives blood when it returns from your lungs and it needs to have some degree of elasticity to be able to receive that blood. And if it can't do that, the blood is only pumped under very high pressure. And that often leads to uh, symptoms of heart failure or breathlessness with exertion, significant fatigue and limitations in exercise capacity. So there does come a point when your heart can be too strong. Uh, and so controlling your blood pressure is really an essential way to help reduce those risks. Next slide. 
in terms of risk factors, uh, there's a few here that came from the American Heart Association's uh, annual uh, statistics report that this is a glimpse from the future. It's actually been released online, but has not been published yet. So the publication date is the 23rd. So you're getting a glimpse from the future. But this uh, summarizes a number of risks uh, that have been identified in the literature. Uh, there was a Norwegian study that showed the 29% risk within 10 years uh, for women that have had complications of pregnancy, such as preeclampsia or gestational diabetes. So for those of you that have had these issues, um, you are at higher risk of developing high blood pressure. It's also clearly been shown that uh, patients or people with lower socioeconomic status, either by income or occupation, and in particular, a lower educational attainment have a markedly increased risk of high blood pressure. There's also been work showing that highly segregated census tracts, uh, folks that live in these areas have a, a almost a six millimeter mercury increase over a 25 year period. So um, there's a number of reasons for this. This is uh, an example of uh, people have speculated that this um, type of health outcome is one of the reasons that we have uh, health disparities and is an example of how uh, there are elements of structural racism that port, um, affect people's health. Um, there also have been studies showing higher neighborhood safety is associated with lower systolic blood pressure. Next slide. Uh, what can we do to treat high blood pressure? Um, one of the easiest things you can do is restrict your sodium intake, of, also known as salt. Um, about each 1,000 milligrams is associated with a five millimeter of mercury higher systolic blood pressure and two millimeter of mercury higher diastolic blood pressure. So minimizing your sodium uh, intake is one important factor. Um, intermediate vigorous physical activity can cut your risk substantially as well. Um, so this is something that uh, I won't say it doesn't cost anything because uh, going to the gym can cost, although many are closed right now, but this doesn't have to be um, something where you're getting drenched in sweat and are completely exhausted. So being active is another essential way to help uh, maximize your uh, cardiovascular health and its impact on high blood pressure is one of the key ways that this happens. You'll hear more from Dr. Park about the role of sleep apnea, but people that have sleep apnea have a markedly increased risk of high blood pressure. What happens if you have apnea is you snore or stop breathing. This leads to drops in your oxygen level, which uh, can lead to high uh, uh, levels of circulating hormones like adrenaline, and these can also increase your blood pressure. So um, knowing if you have sleep apnea and treating it is also another way to help minimize your risk of the complications of high blood pressure. Weight loss can help. This doesn't need to be shedding 30 or 40 pounds, even dropping five to 10 uh, pounds can help with uh, lowering blood pressure. And there are also a number of medications and there's a lot of options. This is one of the broadest classes of pills that are out there because it's such a common problem. And there's also, uh, it's nice that a lot of these are pills that have been around for a while. So they're not the ones that are the most expensive on the block. Next slide. This is a slide from one of my partners uh, that he had put together listing all of the different types of medications that he could sort of find or think of that can be used to treat high blood pressure. The yellow categories are different classes of medications, meaning they have different mechanisms of action. Um, they work on different parts of your body um, and different hormones and other things that can increase your blood pressure. I think what you'll appreciate is even without um, looking at all the specific names, which they're small enough that I don't, certainly don't expect anyone to um, uh, be able to read them very well, but there's many different classes. And even within most of these classes, there are many different options. This is important to note because I think it's really essential that you work with your healthcare provider on if medication treatment is right for you, uh, finding one or, or several, and in fact, most people who need treatment for high blood pressure need more than one medication, that you almost certainly can find a medication that will work well for you and have minimal to no side effects. This is especially important because high blood pressure is something that is typically asymptomatic. And so one of the things that can be a challenge as a physician is taking a patient with who feels fine and put them on medications that might make them feel worse and in many cases will have side effects. And so it's a tough trade-off to be on something that makes you feel worse now to reduce the risk of problems in the future. So if you're having problems, there are almost always other medications or other classes that might be a better fit for you and your body. 
Uh, pills are not the only thing that we have to offer. There's a, an interesting uh, investigational concept that's being looked at right now. Um, historically, there was some work in the 1950s describing uh, disruption of the nerves to your kidney and the, some of the anatomy in that area. The kidney plays a critical role in high blood pressure, and it was found that by uh, essentially cutting many of these nerves, it dramatically reduced people's blood pressure. We're certainly certainly not ready to take all 120 million Americans and um, subject them to open abdominal surgery to cut nerves to your kidneys, uh, but there is work being done on whether catheter-based approaches where we go in through a vein or an artery and are able to perhaps damage or um, limit these nerves may be an alternative to taking daily medications. As I said, this clearly remains investigational and, and stay tuned, but I um, just wanted to let you know that there are some other options for high blood pressure that are coming down the pike. Next slide. Um, there's a number of myths I wanted to mention. One is high blood pressure runs in my family. There's nothing I can do to prevent it. Um, it, it certainly can be familial, uh, but a lot of the things that we talked about earlier uh, are good examples of how you can reduce your risk. Um, another thing that we often hear is, well, I don't use salt. I don't even have a salt shaker. And I think that's uh, admirable, but most of the sodium that we get in our foods is hidden in the foods or it's already there, particularly in processed foods. Anything that comes in a box or a can um, is almost certainly full of sodium. Um, it's also been suspected that kosher or sea salt is different uh, and that they are low sodium alternatives. That's not true. Salt is salt. Um, there are salt substitutes that are usually potassium salts as opposed to sodium salts, um, and they may be appropriate for you depending on your medical circumstances. Um, I think it's been clear from some of my other comments that um, high blood pressure is typically asymptomatic, at least in the relatively earlier phases. Um, but this is something where just because you feel fine doesn't mean your blood pressure is fine. Uh, another myth that's out there is wine is good for the heart. I should drink as much as I want. That's certainly not true. Um, you know, consumption should be uh, moderate at most. And it's very clear that excess alcohol consumption can be toxic to your heart. Uh, and so this is something that uh, is not in the category of some is good, more is better. Um, the last thing is the concept, my blood pressure has been lower so I can stop my medication. Uh, this is uh, not uh, unlike the uh, famous comment by uh, uh, former uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, when commenting on some voting rights legislation about uh, the utility of an umbrella in the rain, where if you're not getting wet, uh, you don't need your umbrella anymore, um, is sort of a, a, a silly concept. Um, it's the same with blood pressure. If your blood pressure is lower on medication, that means it's working and you should continue it. Next slide, please. Uh, just a couple of links here. Uh, if you're interested in more information about high blood pressure, the first is from the American Heart Association's uh, website. And then the, the second link is to the uh, technical update that has loads of statistics and, and great detail about uh, high blood pressure and uh, a number of other cardiovascular disease uh, entities and statistics. Um, as I said, this is a glimpse from the future. It has not been published yet, but it is available online. Uh, I'll stop here. And again, thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Ekman. So informative and helpful. I really appreciate you being with us this morning and also sharing all this great information. A reminder to our um, attendees that we will be sending out a link that includes the recording today, helpful resources, as well as these links that Dr. Ekman just shared. And if you have any questions from what Dr. Ekman shared or what's going to be shared by our final two panelists, please remember to put those in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. So I will now turn it over to Julie Sieber who will share more with us about healthy eating and physical activity. Julie. Okay. Thank you for attending early this morning. Um, and it's now we're going to talk about some components of healthy living. And these are things that that we need to start working on. It's sometimes it's going to take some time, but then we follow them for our lifetime and uh, help help us feel better. Uh, next slide. Healthy eating is an important part of healthy living. And so to reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke, uh, what we eat makes a big difference. Next slide. Next slide. Physical activity uh, is another important part of healthy living. And um, 
that's one that um, is, we're not doing very well on as Americans, only about 20% of us get enough physical activity to meet the recommendations. Next slide. So our, our mental and physical health are closely linked and the World Health Organization has named stress as the health ep epidemic of the 21st century. Uh, and stress often uh, contributes to, healthy e to unhealthy eating, overeating and drinking too much alcohol. Some studies have found that when people don't get enough sleep, they're much more likely to eat more and to eat foods that are less healthy. Um, Science-based information is important and the information that the American Heart Association provides is based on science. It's easy to understand, it's actionable, and it's um, um, uh, very useful. And the heart.org website under the Healthy Living tab has loads of information about all these uh, things and it has even uh, uh, place you can sign up to get information on a regular basis to help you implement healthy eating. Um, eating smart is one of the really important things that that you can do, and you don't you don't have to be a gourmet cook to do this. It's um, just making good choices in the grocery store and making good choices in restaurants and and in your workplace, avoiding the donuts and so on. Um, and now it's become really easy with the meal kits in the grocery stores or home meal delivery services like HelloFresh and Blue Apron. And also the internet has made it much more easy to find good healthy recipes. There are many, many sites that you can find uh, for that. Next slide. One of the easiest ways to have healthy nutritious meals is to think about the color. If you look at the salad plate here, look at all the beautiful colors uh, that are there and mostly due to fruits and vegetables. And fruits and vegetables are one of the most important things that we can eat. They, they give us all the vita or many of the vitamins and minerals that we need and also help, help us feel satisfied without eating a lot of extra calories. Next slide. Um, eating seasonally is sometimes um, easier and sometimes more economical. Uh, although in our modern grocery stores, we have most of these foods um, year, most, most of the year round. Uh, we're right now in winter and some of the things that are available are like bok choy and broccoli, cauliflower, a lot of the sturdy greens like collard greens um, and uh, endive and leafy greens. Uh, uh, the root vegetables are, are something that store well, so they're very available, but um, just making sure that you uh, think about the colors on your plate uh, is important. Um, fat is another thing that we need to think about. And the important thing is to choose uh, uh, mostly unsaturated fats. That's the polyunsaturated and the monounsaturated. And some of the examples of those are canola oil and olive oil. Uh, and to limit saturated fats by reducing the intake of red meat and fatty dairy foods and butter. Uh, you can now find uh, butter substitutes in the, the grocery store that are, have canola oil or olive oil as uh, one of the components to, uh, to reduce the intake of saturated fat. Uh, also avoiding trans fats and highly saturated fats like coconut oil. Um, and an interesting thing with trans fats were used because they make the food products more shelf stable. And so when um, trans, the food producing companies started trying to reduce trans fats, a lot of them uh, substituted saturated fats like coconut oil and palm oil, but these also increase undesirable cholesterol levels. Um, added sugar is another um, thing that we need to think about. The American Heart Association recommends limiting sugar to nine teaspoons a day for most men and six teaspoons for most women and children over two. But the average adult is consuming about 17 teaspoons. So you can see we're pretty far off the target there. Uh, sugary drinks provide almost half of the added sugar. Um, a 12 ounce can of soda soda provides between nine and 10 teaspoons of sugar. So it's already over for, for uh, both 
well for women and, and at, at the limit for men. And that's not considering any baked goods, candy, cereals, dairy products like sweetened yogurt and ice cream. All of those add sugar as well. Uh, and not, as um, was just mentioned, nine out of 10 Americans consume too much sodium. Um, and the, the average American is consuming about 3,400 milligrams of sodium, but the Heart Association recommends only cons consuming 1,500 milligrams. So most of us are over twice what's recommended uh, for, for a day. Uh, again, it's the, the frozen and packaged foods um, that a lot of the sodium comes from, but fortunately those are labeled. So you can actually look at the sodium content and only about 10% of the average person's sodium intake comes from home cooked food or, or salt added at the table. Uh, one, one other factor, if, if you feel thirsty after eating a meal, um, Sometimes that's an indication that it's high in sodium. Um, my husband and I have particularly noticed that with some pizzas that um, we, we're looking at each other and saying, boy, I feel thirsty. Um, so uh, just a, a way to tell it, tell uh, sodium content for some uh, foods. Uh, physical activity recommendation is 150 minutes per week of heart pumping physical activity. So this, you wanna, um, be active to the point that your heart is pumping to um, get the benefit of it, but you also wanna be able to talk. So if, if you can't talk to the, to the person you might be exercising with, you're probably, probably need to slow it down just a little bit, at least until your fitness improves. Uh, muscle strength, strengthening activities are recommended at least twice a week. And one of the critical things is just to move more and sit less. Uh, so think about what, how else can I do an activity besides sitting? Um, any, any amount of physical activity is better than just sitting all day. Uh, being sedentary um, elevates the risk for chronic diseases. And so um, think about small bursts of activity, get up and stretch every hour. If you, if you have a job where you have to sit, stand up when you have a phone call, when you're taking a phone call or go for a short walk as often as you can. Even going up and down stairs is helpful. Next slide. Uh, move, move more uh, with more intensity, sit less. So here's some examples of things that, that you can do. 10 minutes of stretching. Uh, 20 minutes of vacuuming uh, is like walking a mile. Uh, two and a half hours of walking every week is like walking across the state of Wyoming. 30 minutes of ten tennis, an hour of dancing, 30 minutes of grocery shopping. If, if you stop and think about it, as you're grocery shopping, you're walking around the store. So a larger grocery store is better than a smaller one for that. Uh, next slide. Um, Gradually adding intensity is the way to work up to a healthy lifestyle. So you can start with, with moderate physical activity, walking briskly, water aerobics, bicycling, ballroom dancing is another one if that's something you enjoy. And then work up to more vigorous activity like race walking or jogging, swimming laps, um, bicycling harder, faster, uh, jumping rope and so on. Next slide. Along with eating right and being active, um, being really healthy includes getting enough sleep, which you'll hear about in just a minute, uh, practicing mindfulness, managing stress, and keeping your body and mind fit. Next slide. So some ways that you can fight stress is to slow down, plan ahead, allow time to do the most important things without rushing. And remember, maybe everything doesn't have to be done that you initially think. Uh, sleeping more. Uh, letting go of worries. If there, if there are things that are, that are stressful, uh, sometimes just writing them down helps uh, to clear your mind. Uh, laughing uh, is a really good way to reduce stress and getting connected with friends, calling a friend, uh, doing something with a friend, at least when COVID is, is over. Um, other healthy habits include getting organized um, and really prioritizing and figuring out what really has to be done. Uh, volunteering has been shown to be really, really uh, stress reducing, uh, giving back and thinking of people outside, outside yourself, uh, being active, as we said, and um, trying to break any bad habits such as um, too much alcohol, tobacco, or caffeine. 
remember, think about what it is that you can change. And if it's something that you can't change, then figuring out another way to deal with it than, um, than worrying about it. So thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate uh, you sharing all these tips for us and information. And just a reminder to our attendees that we will be sending the recording and links, as well as some information about the AHA's Life Simple 7, which will um, be another way for you to just track on some healthy habits. Um, and so finally, I'd like to bring up Dr. Park, who will share more about how important sleep is to our overall health. Dr. Park? Well, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone slept well, and I'll let that sink in for just a minute. Um, but so once again, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the uh, importance of sleep and how that impacts just your overall well-being and your health. <clears throat> so over the um, uh, next 15 minutes or so, we'll talk about why good sleep is so important. We'll talk about some disorders and habits that'll, that could potentially rob you of your good sleep. And then we'll finish off with some things to help improve your sleep. As uh, Holly mentioned, um, I, uh, this is a great uh, resource from the American Heart Association, uh, Life Simple 7. And you've already heard Dr. Eckman talk about the importance of blood pressure. You've heard um, Ms. Uh, Sieber talk about uh, healthy eating habits and exercise, but there are other habits, stopping smoking, et cetera, blood sugar, cholesterol checks, and weight things. And so these, uh, I think Life Simple 7, I think is a really great um, resource for folks to just get a sense of where they are in their uh, healthy habits. But I guess uh, feeling kind of left out, um, I thought I'd kind of start this you want to hear about of, healthy sleep? <laughs> of uh, Life Simple 7 Plus. Um, and for that plus, I wanted to add, add the importance of sleep and we'll uh, spend some time talking about why. But before we go there, I wanted to spend a little time talking about what is actually normal sleep because I think people's misperception of what normal sleep is can skew what they think they need to get and it may actually be potentially detrimental. So it turns out uh, when, a national, when the National Sleep Foundation did a survey of uh, over 10,000 individuals to get a sense of what is a normal sleep, what does normal sleep look like? And they separated that out into young adults, adults and older adults. And what it turns out um, is two things. One, that most of us probably need around seven to eight hours. Seven to eight hours of sleep is kind of the average uh, of what most of us feel we need to be able to fully function the next day. But the other point there is that there's a wide spectrum of what is considered sufficient or adequate healthy sleep. And you'll notice that ranges somewhere around five to even 12 hours. And for our, some of our older patients, again, four to 10, 11 hours or so. It, what that means is that all of us have different sleep needs. And to be frank, probably four to five might be short for most individuals, but um, six or six and a half hours might actually be sufficient for some individuals. And I find that in my practice, there are some, sometimes there's some tension between spouses that one says, oh, you're not getting enough sleep, you should sleep more. Or the other says, oh, you're sleeping too much. 10 hours, you shouldn't need that much sleep. But in fact, I think we need to recognize that all of us have different sleep needs. Likewise, if it turns out that your body actually only needs about seven hours of sleep, forcing yourself to spend eight, nine hours in bed can actually be detrimental to the sleep quality. You'll actually end up getting lighter stages of sleep. You'll end up waking up more. And so it's really trying to find and understand what your body needs are um, and recognizing that all of us have different needs. The other thing I wanted to talk about what a normal sleep is, is how our sleep kind of evolves over the course of the night. This is what we call a hypnogram, which maps different sleep stages as we go through the night. And to orient you, this is the hours that we're uh, presumably in bed sleeping. And you'll notice that these, uh, these W represents awake. So that spending, ten, taking 15, 20 minutes to fall asleep is, uh, is considered uh, average. This next line called R is represents REM sleep. That's these black bars. And then N1 through three, those are different stages of sleep with N3 representing deep sleep. So what you'll notice off the bat one is that, again, it takes 15, 30 minutes on average for most people to fall asleep. Yes, there are those, the moment they hit their bed, they're out. There are those who might take longer to fall asleep, but that's kind of the normative. And it turns out during the night, you'll have these brief periods of awakening. That's actually, again, considered normal. Some people might get up to use the bathroom. Some people just might wake up a little bit, turn, roll over and go right back to sleep. Sleeping continuously through the night, um, while it happens, many people don't recall that they had these brief moments of awakening. 
some people just recall every one of these awakenings and go, oh, I'm not sleeping well. But part of it, again, it really just understanding that these brief awakening is considered normal. And as I mentioned, at our, as our sleep evolves, you notice that we get more of this deep sleep in the first half of the night, and then our dream sleep more in the second half of the night. And the reason I emphasize that is rather than breaking up your sleep into different segments, it's better to try to get your sleep in one continuous segment. Now, again, I recognize that some of us who work shift work, it's just hard to do that. Um, but, but ideally, if it's, if it's possible to try to identify what your sleep time is and try to protect it as best you can and say between 11 and six or 11 and seven, that's my sleep time. And so really that shouldn't be the time that you check your email, go on the internet, clean the house, go shopping. That really should try to protect that time and try to make sure you get that time in a single um, continuum. The, the negative effects of not sleeping well, again, you've heard Dr. Ekman talk about its impact on the heart and heart health. Um, as mentioned, if you have this disorder called obstructive sleep apnea, where individuals actually stop breathing during their night, uh, during their sleep, we know that that's an independent risk factor for things like blood pressure problems, high blood, uh, uh, heart attack, and so forth. You can also imagine if you're not sleeping well, if you're a little sleepy, your ability to recall things, your memory, your how your brain functions at a higher level, all of those things can be affected. And it also turns out your mood can be certainly impacted. You can imagine if you're not sleeping well or sleeping sufficiently and you're tired, most folks would tend to be a little bit more irritable and, and less tolerant of things. And so recognize that it has certainly a lot of brain um, impacts. This is a study out of the National Institute of Health that looked at just those who have interrupted sleep, not necessarily these disorders like sleep apnea, but having interrupted sleep, this is a blood vessel. And to kind of orient you, this is obviously enlarged, but a blood vessel, and you'll notice the thickness of a normal blood vessel versus the thickness of an um, uh, experimental model where they, didn't, uh, where they slept poorly, had a lot of awakenings. And just that interrupted sleep and how it affects our body you can imagine that if the blood vessel starts doing this, and this is your heart vessel, as it gets more narrowed, you're more likely to have things like heart attack and strokes and so forth. This is another fascinating study um, done out of uh, Boston University that looked at what happens to our brain and brain fluid while we're asleep. So this red pulse and this blue pulse, this what it's actually showing is how there's kind of a rinsing cycle or a washing cycle in our brain while we're asleep. And there's lots of implications. Previously, there are some thoughts that if you're not sleeping well or, or uh, sleeping too little, that you develop these plaques in the brain that may be associated with things like Alzheimer's. And so the importance of kind of this brainwashing, not the torture type, but the cleansing type of brainwashing, or that would actually be beneficial to the brain health. And this is just one of many studies that suggest why it's so important for us to sleep well. Other things, so it turns out there are some GI effects of not sleeping well. Many of our hormones, it turns out it follows what's called a circadian rhythm. So some hormones are released during the night, some hormones are suppressed at night and released during the day. And again, based on that kind of night day cycle, if you're not sleeping well, or you have other things, bright light and these things that's affecting your circadian rhythm, certainly many of our hormones can be affected. Again, your kidney function, but also your immune system. There's a fascinating study that looked at for example, they took a group of patients and they said, okay, you sleep, you know, six, seven, uh, seven, eight hours. Another group said, okay, you only sleep four hours. They both groups got the flu vaccine. And then they looked at how did their body respond to the flu vaccine? Um, if you slept well versus not, it turns out those who didn't sleep well, their body's production of these protective uh, antibodies to the flu vaccine was much more suppressed versus those who slept well. So again, immune function and all these things are Again, emphasizing that why it's so important to get a good night's sleep. So then recognizing why good night's sleep is so important, let's spend a little time in talking about what can affect, uh, rob us of our good sleep. Unfortunately, these electronics, especially our younger generation, they seem like, it seems like they're always on their electronic device, phones, iPads, computers, watching television way late into the night, <clears throat> excuse me. But so these electronic devices, not only is it stimulating our brain, but the light from these things can actually affect our circadian rhythm and delay our ability to get to sleep. Many of the habits that we've developed over time, so coffee, um, alcohol, and, and smoking. Again, as a pulmonologist, again, I re reiterate the importance of stopping smoking, not only for your heart and brain health and all those, but certainly it's a negative impact on sleep. 
Some folks say, you know, I drink a pot of coffee and I can go to sleep. And it turns out it's actually true. When we study these individuals, they can actually, their time to falling asleep is relatively short, but about three to four hours when that caffeine level peaks in our brain, we see these, a lot of these awakenings or these arousals that interrupts our sleep. Likewise, alcohol. Some people say, oh, alcohol just makes me relax and feel like I can fall asleep sooner. And once again, that ability to fall asleep sooner turns out to be true. But what we see again is that they have lots of these interruptions or arousals during their sleep. And nicotine is another brain stimulant um, that again, turns out could also negatively impact our sleep. Especially now with many folks staying at home and doing a lot of work at home, we find that, you know, finally they can get a little nap. Um, but what we also understand is taking too long or too frequent a nap during the day will impact your sleep at night. So uh, if you'll pardon the analogy, I kind of liken our sleep to a pressure cooker, meaning the longer you're awake, you develop this pressure. So like a pressure cooker, if you keep opening that lid, you're going to relieve that pressure. So it turns out naps. So if you, the longer you're awake, as your brain develops this pressure over time of wanting to go to sleep, and stay asleep, if you take these frequent or too long a naps, you relieve that body's brain's pressure of wanting to go to sleep and stay asleep. And therefore, your ability to fall asleep and stay asleep at night can be negatively impacted. It turns out there is some studies that suggest shorter naps, 15, no more than 30 minutes in the middle of the day when we get what we call a circadian dip around one to three. That's kind of where the old countries had these, um, these siestas that maybe a short nap at that time may be okay, but anything longer than that can be um, certainly negatively affect your sleep quality. And again, as with um, many folks, particularly our younger folks, they just have these irregular sleep schedule. They go to sleep at five. Sometimes they go to sleep at, at nine and these variable sleep schedules, again, we know that that can negatively affect your sleep. And then we also need to recognize um, as kind of Dr. Ekman talked about some of the medications, we know that some of them will cause insomnia some of them cause uh, wakefulness and so, or sleepiness. And so we recognize that some medic uh, medications can affect our ability to fall asleep and stay asleep or for cause us to feel too sleepy during the day. So recognizing that and talking to your provider about some of these things would be important. Other disorders, as again, as Dr. Ekman mentioned this, sleep apnea. So those are the individuals, typically they snore very heavily, very loudly. Um, and, then, and then all of a sudden you don't hear anything. And then it seems like it goes for forever. And then out of the blue, they'll <laughs> have this big gasp and breath. And we know that that's what's happening there is as they're sleeping, as their muscles relax, their airway actually collapses. So they can't breathe until at some point when the brain says, wake up, take a breath. And at that moment, there's, as the brain arouses, stresses the heart, airway opens and they take this big gasp. Every time that happens, again, it stresses the heart. And we know that that not only is it awakening your brain and, for, and interrupting your sleep quality, but again, it has other health consequences. People with um, uh, insomnia, so they just, some people just are, are such that they just can't get to sleep and fall asleep. We know that there are this many disorders that can contribute to that. Other disorders, chronic cough, um, these things where, or breathing problems, COPD, heart failure. We know these breathing problems certainly can affect your ability to sleep at night. There's a disorder called restless leg syndrome where you just, ah, I just can't, your legs just feel irritable and just can't, feel, can't get it to settle down and it's very disruptive. And if your legs can't relax and you can't relax, so it's hard for you to fall asleep. Again, as I mentioned this depression, we know those who are depressed, they don't sleep well. Likewise, if you don't sleep well, you feel depressed. Not that not sleeping well leads to depression, but you just don't feel as good. And so we know depression could rob you of your good sleep nightmare disorders, and some people tend to act out dreams, which is disruptive not only to the patient, but to the spouse. You can imagine if the person is imagining they're fighting off, protecting their loved ones, that sometimes that can be very disruptive and concerning for the spouse. So it can affect both bed partners. Um, again, and, and shift work, those who uh, obviously have to change their work schedules, obviously that can negatively affect our sleep. So what can we do to try to help optimize our sleep? Again, as you heard uh, Ms. Uh, Sieber talk about importance of exercise. If you can do it, it's great for your brain health. We know it staves off uh, dementia. It's great for your heart. It's, and it turns out it's great for your sleep. And now again, in this current pandemic where people tend to be less active, they tend to, they find that they're less, um, their sleep quality is deteriorated. So regular exercise is just very important. 
as I mentioned earlier, getting regular sleep pattern. Um, so again, try to find out, and again, it may take some kind of investigation, if you will, on your part to know what is good sleep uh, time for you. But once you understand what that sleep requirement is, again, I would encourage you to try to really protect that time. And again, recognizing that trying to sleep more than what your body needs can also be detrimental. As I mentioned, some things that can rob you of your sleep. So really trying to minimize that, the electronic time and alcohol. Again, a glass of wine with dinner several hours before you're ready to go to bed is probably okay. Obviously, having some downtime or watching some television or these things before you go to sleep. But many of these things we recommend, including nicotine and caffeine, but many of these things at least several hours before you go to bed, you should minimize. Ideally, again, nicotine, I encourage you to stop smoking if you are. Uh, but caffeine, certainly nothing uh, more than later afternoon would be preferred. And some people, it turns out even a single cup of coffee in the morning can affect their sleep at night. As I mentioned, there are some studies suggesting, suggesting shorter naps are okay, but really trying to avoid long naps. And then recognizing that if you're doing all these things, you just feel not, you just don't feel rested in the morning. I'd strongly encourage you to visit with your primary provider and have that conversation. And whether you need to refer to a sleep specialist or they can work on some things on their own, again, I really encourage you to talk to your doctor about um, your sleep. And if you're not getting a good night's sleep, it's so important that, um, that you address that issue. Some of the links, again, I think you'll get this, um, but this is from the American Heart Association, the National Institute of Health, and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. These are all patient uh, uh, focused, um, uh, so general public focused uh, websites uh, to really kind of help you understand uh, sleep and uh, sleep, uh, healthy sleep habits. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Park. Very helpful information for us and uh, just so important to get that good night's sleep for sure. Um, we have a couple of questions. So pull back our panelists, uh, Dr. Ekman, Joey Sieber, and Dr. Park. And um, Dr. Ekman, I'll start with you. Um, you know, since blood pressure, some high blood pressure sometimes doesn't show symptoms, the question we had was, you know, how can I be proactive in monitoring my blood pressure? And at what stage of life should we be doing that? Uh, it's a great question. I, you know, I think, like I said, there's a lot of options for home blood pressure cuffs that you can get. Um, you know, other options are most fire stations will offer blood pressure checks. You certainly could take advantage of that. Um, I think it's worth it. You know, most households have a thermometer. Um, so you can check if you have a fever. I think most households should also have a blood pressure cuff. Um, I think it's worth checking periodically. If it's normal and you're, let's say in your twenties, uh, you know, checking it, couple times a year might be enough. As you get older, probably should check more often. Um, and if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, it's probably also worth checking periodically. Maybe it's, you know, weekly or a couple times a month just to get a sense of what is your blood pressure uh, in a typical day and, and, you know, during your normal life. I will note that um, people are often surprised to hear that their blood pressure varies and they'll check it and it'll be 125 and then they check it again and it's 135 and that's very normal. Um, blood pressure is not a static thing. And so the more data points you have, the easier it is to tell if, if, if you either need treatment or if the treatments you're on are working. So as you get older, I think certainly should be checking it more frequently. I think most people, um, certainly by the time they're in their 40s or 50s, should be checking it periodically. Um, you know, again, the frequency varies a little bit depending on your other health status and conditions, but it's something that is important for everyone to know what their blood pressure is. Thank you. Um, next question for Julie. Do, you know, we hear a lot of uh, information that, depending on the season in the news about eggs being great for us and then eggs being bad for us. Any uh, thoughts on that for our attendees? Uh, yes. The, um, at one point, uh, it was almost recommended that people not eat eggs uh, 30 year or so years ago, but um, that's uh, found not to be necessary. So eating a moderate amount of eggs is fine. Um, your, your body produces more cholesterol than you take in from, from eating an egg or two. So moderation is key here. Um, Dr. Park, question for you. You know, uh, again, something we hear people say a lot is, I'm just going to catch up on my sleep. Is that really possible when you haven't had a good night's sleep to catch up on the weekend or catch up during the day with naps? Uh, it is, and that's a great question. So thank you for that. Um, what I... Um, 
so it turns out our sleep, so we actually develop what's called a sleep debt. So for example, if your body requires seven hours of sleep every night, and for whatever reason, you're only getting six, at the end of the week, you're actually a seven hours short. And so this is where often folks will try to catch up, kind of catch up on their sleep on the weekends. And so it does take some time. Um, so it's usually a few more days or however, whatever your sleep that's been. Obviously, there's a limit. So it's not like if you've been sleep deprived every day for 365 days, it's not like you're 365 hours short. <laughs> but but so there is obviously some limit to it. So you can catch up on, on those sleep debts. But again, this is where if you recognize that you feel like you need to sleep longer on weekends, again, I'd, I'd have you reconsider, can you get a little bit more sleep during the weekday so you don't have to feel like you need to take more? Again, I caution that, um, again, trying to force yourself to sleep longer, again, isn't always beneficial, so watch for that. But, but yes, you can, there is, if you, you know, again, if you're shift work or otherwise, you just can't get enough sleep. Again, we do try to encourage you to catch up on your sleep on a, uh, the next few days, but really then um, trying to relook at things and see if you can improve your sleep on a more consistent basis. And then one other question we had was about melatonin and, mm -hmm. and taking that to help you mm -hmm. fall asleep. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. So melatonin is something that our brain naturally produces. And again, that melatonin follows what we call that circadian rhythm. So it kind of follows the day night cycle and to augment it is where people, sometimes people feel like that melatonin is helpful. Few cautions, melatonin, because it's not FDA regulated, we do recommend you are careful about the product. So ideally we recommend made by a reputable company, made in the States just because uh, many of the uh, pharmaceuticals in the States have a little bit more regulation. And so, and just pure melatonin if you're going to take it. Um, again, I would say if you need it, if you feel like you need it occasionally, oh, that's fine. If you feel like you need it consistently, again, I would suggest you talk to your provider about why is it that you need something to help you with your sleep on a regular basis. The studies, and, and we use melatonin for various disorders, but where in regards to sleep, where it's most helpful is probably jet lag. So if you're traveling different time zones and you're off your own circadian rhythm, um, uh, then trying to realign your current body to where you are uh, traveling to, to kind of help realign that, that uh, melatonin might be helpful. But as, in terms of side effects, again, as long as it's a reputable company and, and pure melatonin, the side effect seems fairly minimal. You can find doses anywhere from 0.3 to 10 milligrams. Uh, probably again, like most things, modest, uh, modest dose is probably okay. So somewhere that three or less milligram is probably a reasonable dose. Again, I wouldn't crank up to 20, 30 milligrams. Again, that would be, turns out not, not, not helpful, but whether it has side effects, we don't really know. Um, but again, if you feel like if you need to take it consistently, again, I would encourage them to talk to their provider about that. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, and just hearing you talk about traveling somewhere sounds so dreamy, doesn't it? Um, so we have about five minutes. I'd like to ask um, each of our panelists just to um, give some final thoughts um, or tips. Um, and I'm going to actually start with um, you, Julie, because we also just got a question about, you know, what's better, margarine or butter? So maybe you could answer that and then give us your final thought and tip. Well, um... Uh, margarine made with a polyunsaturated, a monounsaturated fat is probably better. Um, butter occasionally for, you know, those places where it really makes a difference for flavor uh, is probably okay. But uh, pick one with uh, canola oil or olive oil as, as one of the main ingredients is, is a good tip. Um, and I guess the one of the most important things is just think about this as a journey um, in terms of lifestyle. You, you, if you try to change everything, you know, tomorrow, <laughs> you're probably not going to be successful, but, but start thinking about it um, on a, a pretty regular basis and try to add in some, you know, better eating and, and some more exercise and so on um, and gradually work up to, uh, to what you can do. Thank you, Julie. And uh, Dr. Ekman, you know, uh, love that tip about, you know, getting a monitoring your blood pressure like you would your uh, temperature by having some resources to do so, like a thermometer equivalent. Um, one more question is just, you know, women, um, you know, it's it's heart month. We talk a lot about Go Red for women, and it being the si heart disease being the silent killer. You know, if someone is concerned and wanting to just really take 
a proactive approach to their health? Would you recommend going to a specialist or their physician? If you could answer that and then go into a final thought and tip, that would be great. Sure. You know, I think there it is definitely worth an investment in prevention. And by that, I mean, even if you feel well, it is worth going to see the doctor. Um, you know, I, ironically, uh, that's something women tend to be better at than men. Um, asymptomatic men um, often need to be dragged with wild horses to come to the doctor. Um, so I want to commend all you women out there for being great about this and for helping uh, encourage the men in your life to go to the doctor because that's often what prompts it. My wife said I had to come or my sister said I had to come. Um, but I think, um, you know, the, the things from cardiovascular health standpoint that really make a big difference are not smoking, controlling your blood pressure, um, being screened for diabetes, treating it if you have it, being screened for high cholesterol if you have it. And these things are additive, you know, small changes that start when you're in your 30s make it much more uh, likely that you'll remain in good health when you're in your 60s. Um, and it's never too late to start. Um, being screened for these problems in your 40s will help you be better health health when you're in your 70s and, and, you know, so on and so forth. So it's a small investment. Um, most of the treatments for high blood pressure in particular are very well tolerated. They dramatically reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack and heart failure. And so it's really a worthwhile investment. So I think... <clears throat> one of the, um, you know, the, the simple seven, I think is a great thing to be aware of and and look for. Um, but think of this as an investment in your uh, physical health that will pay dividends in your mental health longevity. And uh, once we escape from the pandemic and can travel and be social again, uh, you'll be glad you did it. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, and Dr. Park, for your final thoughts, I wonder if you could also share some simple ways for us to just get a a regular sleeping schedule, you know, there's so much overwhelm right now. And so even hearing this information, you know, someone might say, oh my goodness, I know it's important, but how do I begin? So if you could help us with some simple ways to start, that would be great. Thank you. So I think, again, being mindful of those things that can rob. So I think just these healthy habits, like anything, eating regular, eating healthy, exercising regularly, I think those are important. But if you take a step back and Think about, well, if you, know, if you had a child, how would you take care of that child? So you slow things down as it gets close to bedtime. You say, okay, Johnny, time to put things away. Let's slow things down. Let's take a bath. Let's read a book. And now it lights off, go to sleep tonight, Johnny, right? We do that with our young ones. And so I would encourage that maybe starting to develop that routine. So, okay, well, oh, it's, I, if 11 o'clock is your bedtime, let's start slowing things down. Let's turn down the lights. Let's put away the electronics and those things and hopefully kind of develop that healthy habit to help you get good sleep. I love that. Well, thank you, Julie, Dr. Park, Dr. Ekman. What a wonderful sharing of information this morning and helping us all to take a proactive approach for our own health and well-being.